Hey guys, alright, today we are back with another History Matters video. This time, how did ancient slash medieval borders work? Short animated documentary. Now, I will say that I think there is a slight difference between ancient and medieval borders. Um, I don't really know anything about ancient borders, but I can make an assumption about medieval borders based on feudalism. Um, so if we look at feudalism, of course, we have tiny... And I'm sure this is kind of how ancient borders worked. You know, there was the, em let's just go basic emperor, you know, kind of system. You have the emperor, and then you have lords under him who rule certain amounts of land, right? So, um, I don't know, a lord rules over Cornwall, uh, Dorset kind of area. Um, so he has a bunch of castles or something. He'll have minor lords as well there. Um, and pretty much all the peasants in that area know that. Who they're the who's their lord pretty much um and so they refer to him they know that um but also like that lord is then in charge of his own borders um god it's weird to ex i actually don't know how to explain this good <laughs> it's i mean it, it, i it, I, <laughs> I don't know why i don't know how to explain this it, it, like i think of it in my head and i'm like yeah that's how it works and then when i try to put words and vocalize it. I can't really. Lords, I guess. I guess lords knew who their neighbors were, and so they knew who controlled what, because that was they had the free time to learn who the other lords were and whatnot. Like, you you rule. I guess you're in. Let's say you're in Wales. Uh, you rule in Northern Wales here or something, and then you know got a neighbor there. You're gonna know your neighbor, so you're gonna know the lands around there. And then, of course, if there is dispute with the borders, you go to war. And then uh, whoever wins gets to decide the next border. I'm sure History Matters is going to explain it far better than I can. Let's go ahead and dive right in. In the town of Barla Nassau, there is a line on the floor. If you're on one side of this line, you're in the Netherlands with its fancy windmills. If you're on the other, you're in Belgium with its convenient access for German armour divisions. Nowadays, many a nation is easily recognisable by its silhouette, and within the borders of a nation, we can easily determine who its people are and all that good stuff. The obvious question yep. is, was it so clear in the ancient or medieval world? Let's no. say you're a Roman peasant. Congratulations, during the reign of Emperor Hadrian, who ruled Rome at its greatest territorial extent. If you simply walked north from Rome, when, if ever, would you know that you'd left the Roman Empire? See, Rome is a good example when discussing borders, because it had a centralised government, a professional army whose job it was to protect the empire, and also the Romans had a good sense of borders, which they called limes. Unsurprisingly, much of Rome's limes stopped at natural barriers, like mountain ranges or perhaps most notably the Rhine or Danubian rivers. The border was sporadically lined with watchtowers and wooden fortifications where possible, but this was a long border and so naturally much of it was unmarked. The biggest exception to this was of course Hadrian's Wall. Maps like this make it look like these areas were firmly in Rome's control and that those outside were entirely foreign. To put it bluntly, this simply wasn't the case. Yes. There were settlements close to the Empire's borders who made quite a living trading with Rome and many of those within the Roman Empire didn't really see themselves as being Roman. Looking at you, Britannia. So Oh my god. Yes. Oh. I get to go on a tangent about Britain under Rome. Oh, kinda. Post Britain never really saw itself as Roman, really. Um, but, and Rome never really saw Britain as its own, like, Nero, let's, let's use Nero as an example, Nero kind of wanted an excuse to get out of Britain, because Britain, honestly, for much of human history has been pretty much a backwater place, nothing really useful there, it wasn't really until the Industrial Revolution where Britain ha actually ended up having the natural resources necessary to become a superpower, which, you know, coal and whatnot coal and other stuff um but you know in, in in this and then when um Boudicca's rebellion began nero honestly kind of wanted to lose because then he could you know use it as an excuse to get out of britain somehow the roman legion up in <laughs> up in britain beat Boudicca, and so he was like well sh and they won spectacularly and so then Nero was like, well, shit, all right, guess we got to keep it. <laughs> um, but then Emperor Honorus, H-O-N-O-R-U-S, I believe it was, um, in the 5th fifth, fifth or 6th century, um, was like, all right, yeah, we're abandoning Britain. And then once the Roman legions left Britain, Britain literally collapsed. It's, com it's 
whole political social structure gone its economic structure completely eviscerated all of it was gone the cities were left to defend themselves it was they what britain turned into when the romans left they returned to pre-roman britain kind of culture you know whereas pretty i guess one way to put it i guess would be barbaric um can't remember the proper term for it barbaric is certainly not the proper term uh but pre they they pretty much went back to pre-roman society when the romans left uh, and they were i believe they are the only R roman province i know of that actually did that i don't know of any other roman provinces that quite collapsed like britain did Oh, yeah, fun fact. Travelling in and out of the empire wasn't too difficult, and many traders did so regularly, even via hard borders like Hadrian's Wall. This ease of travel is why there's so many Roman items and coins found throughout Central, Eastern and Northern Europe. Of course, in the south of the empire, basically the North African coast and Egypt, the southern borders were much harder to patrol. Egypt's southern frontier was one such difficult border, but it did bring great profits. Here, the Romans yes. had to deal with... Egypt and Middle East were where all the money was for uh, Rome. Hence why the Western Roman Empire fucking sucked compared to Eastern Rome and why Eastern Rome was able to last. Uh, because, honestly, for much of human history, Western part of Europe didn't really have the money um, and stuff to be all that worthwhile. I mean, Gaul certainly, France, had much better resources and stuff than Britain did in comparison. But, you know, Iberia was was far more valuable than Gaul was. Hence why, you know, there'd be Roman settlement in Iberia before they started conquest of Gaul. And even then, the conquest of Gaul was pretty much kind of started by Caesar. Um, and then, but even then, I think Germany would have been the better prize over Gaul as well. Because uh, Germany had a shit ton of wood and other resources there, I think, more than Gaul did for the time. I could be wrong on that, though. I don't know. I just know they... Went to Iberia before Gaul, so I'm just going to make the assumption uh, that Iberia had the better resources and money uh, possibility over Gaul. ...with tribes like the Blemye. You may have heard of them before because the Romans believed that these were a people who didn't have heads. The... Huh? I'm confused. The Romans had a good trading relationship with the Blemier, who acted as intermediaries between Rome and the south of Africa, but the Blemier would occasionally raid too. Perhaps Rome's most important border was that with the Parthian, later Sasani, and Persian Empire. Yes, 100%. I totally agree with this. I totally agree that that would probably be the most important border. Here, the border was a series of fortifications, with many, many legions waiting for any Persian invasion, but again, people could and did travel between them. None of what I've told you was stagnant, though. Rome's borders and the look of them fluctuated massively over the centuries until it all came crashing down. So, moving forward over a thousand years from Hadrian, oh. we reach the medieval period, and here we'll okay. focus on the Anglo-Scottish border, formalised in the 1237 Treaty of York. Just to let you know, the Anglo-Scottish border is not marked by Hadrian's Wall, the entirety of which lies in England. This may come as a shock to you, but throughout history, England and Scotland have not been the best of friends. The borderlands... No wow. As an English historian, I am completely surprised. <laughs> Sarcasm. ...known as the Marches played host to many a raid or military campaign over the centuries as both sides sought to bring the other into a permanent state of non-existence. During the times fucking of peace, the faces. two lands had to coexist and local lords came to agreements such as allowing livestock from either kingdom to graze on each other's lands. That's not to say things were peaceful. Bandits, or reeves as they were known, would raid across the border often. In fact, the practice of Scottish raiders extorting money from Englishmen gave birth to the word blackmail, roughly translated as meaning illicit rent. Policing oh. these raids was basically impossible since there was no government capable enough to oversee the roughly 100 mile border. The law of the land on both sides was essentially try not to die and neither the Scottish nor the English crowns were able to do much about it. Needless to say, the border between the two kingdoms in 1237 wasn't simply this line. It was blurred and much of it wasn't defined by natural barriers. To conclude, borders in the modern sense didn't exist either in theory or in practice in the ancient or medieval world. Yeah. What we think of today as borders, those things which can block individuals individuals from moving into a political entity simply weren't feasible a thousand years ago. Instead of strict I, love, I, I just love the idea of a Roman wearing <laughs> wearing a uniform suit like that. There were frontiers which marked a gradual shift from one polity to the next. The frontiers were primarily used by empires or kingdoms to keep out mass movements, i.e. armies instead of individuals. And in yep. that sense, they worked quite well. I hope you enjoyed this. 
I definitely enjoyed that video. That was well fucking made. Um, I literally have no complaints with that. Yeah, that was that was really well explained. Like I said at the beginning, they definitely could explain far better than I could. Um, so yeah, this was. I'm, I I am pleased with this video. Um, and yeah, no, I totally agree. Borders back then would be kind of blurry. Uh, shift a little bit here and there, maybe by like a couple inches, you know, depending on things. I don't know. Um, but yeah, that was how did ancient slash medieval borders work. Short animated documentary by History Matters. I hope you guys enjoyed. I certainly did. Remember to hit that like button and subscribe for more. And I will see you guys in the next video. Peace.